to start with Lambda. So I'm just going to go log into that console. So I'm just logging in with my administrative account. And if I go to Lambda, we have one function to find and we kind of went through that automation process of I want to zip up all the files that are part of that project and then upload those files. That's this MATC hello world. And again, we don't get to see the output of it because it's a zip file. Um, our handler we talked about, that's the starting point of our application, kind of like the sub main of our Java application. But now today what I want to do is if I go up into this designer, so this designer will kind of expand and contract, there's this option to add a trigger. Okay, and that's what I really want to look at today. So I, I don't necessarily want to do it with this function, um, but this API gateway will be a trigger that we use kind of going forward. Today we're going to look at DynamoDB and how the triggers look in DynamoDB, and we'll look at S3 as well. Okay, those are the triggers that we want to hit. And you can see there's a bunch of other triggers that you could use. Right, there's even external kind of plugins into the AWS ecosystem, so partner event sources. But all of these others are just AWS um, services that are offered that then could trigger a Lambda function. Okay. I think triggers are, are fairly easy to work with, so I, I think of today kind of like a, an easy day. The only thing with triggers is, is um, verifying that things worked is sometimes difficult. Okay, and looking at what actually happened as a result of the trigger is sometimes difficult. And the reason I say that is your triggers are going to get executed. So we're going to set up a trigger. We'll, let's start with DynamoDB. So I'm going to set up a trigger in DynamoDB that says, when something changes in the database table, let's go ahead and run some Lambda code. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the setup. That's the premise is I have a DynamoDB table. It changes. I want to get notified of that change. Okay, my code's going to run as a result of that. So I, I've actually used this in production, and what it was was managing user files. So a user would upload their files to an S3 bucket, and they'd own those files so as their storage, and that's how the company stored data. It was like their own central repository, so instead of using Dropbox, they were using S3. But then um, we had temporary customers, and the temporary customers would kind of come and go, so we'd use that storage for those temporary customers, and then when they go away, we want to stop paying for storage, so I had to remove that customer. So in DynamoDB, I'd remove the customer, it would trigger an event in Lambda to say, clean up the S3 resources for that customer. Those S3 resources shouldn't exist anymore. And that's how it was handled. So there was a delete customer. When we encountered that delete, then let's remove the S3 resources that were allocated to that customer. Okay, so it's kind of a simple example, but pretty relevant. Okay, so uh, in order to do this, what I want to do is I'm going to go back to Lambda. I'm going to go to the root of Lambda. I don't know where I am. I want to create a new function. So I'm just going to create a function with the designer. So I'm going to call this um, my DynamoDB trigger. Okay, still in Node is fine. The permissions, we know that we're going to have an issue with permissions, right? Eventually, I'm going to have to hook this up so that I can connect with DynamoDB. Okay, so what I have right now is just a simple message. This is the kind of the default message that we're going to have in Lambda, which gives us a hello world function. We can test it. Works great. Um, what I want to do, though, is I want to set up a trigger so that when something changes in my Dynamo database, that this function gets triggered. And I can set it up on either side of, of things. So I'll show you what I mean by that, but um, eventually, before I set up the trigger, I'm going to have to jump over to DynamoDB, and I'll show you why. 
So if I add a trigger and I choose DynamoDB, it says, what table do you want to base the trigger off of? I only have one table out there, so baseball stats is fine. And it's saying, what, where do you want to start? Do you want the latest, or do I want a specific time horizon? And I'm going to enable the trigger, and then there's some additional settings that you can kind of ignore. Okay, so I could add a trigger that way. But in order for me to actually have the trigger and to have it work, um, I have to go back over to DynamoDB. So under Services, I'm going to open up DynamoDB. And I have my one table. So we'll see this one table. It's running. I have to enable streaming. What streaming is, is it's essentially a change log. In DynamoDB, we didn't talk about streams. But what streaming does is it stores a change log for us, like what happened. So you inserted a record, that's a change. You updated a record, here's the old and new values. You deleted a record, here's the record you deleted. And it gives you kind of an audit log of those changes in that table. That's what streaming is. In order for me to actually trigger a Lambda function, streaming has to be enabled. I have to pay for streaming. Okay, so there is an associated cost with this. It's cheap, it's like three bucks a month. Okay, so I can manage the stream, and I have an option about what is actually gonna go into that stream for the changes. Do I want only the keys? Do I want the new image only? Um, so if I insert a record, that would be a new image. If I update a record, I'd only have the updated values. Do I want only the old stuff? So I know that I've updated it in the database, I have those records there, but do I wanna know what it was changed from? or I can choose new and old. Like it was this, I updated it, and now it's this new object, these new key value pairs. So I'm just gonna take new and old. I want as much information as possible. So I've enabled that stream. And then I told you we could set up the trigger in both directions. So we could go into Lambda and set up the trigger Otherwise, if I'm in a table, I can set up a trigger. So I can connect to an existing Lambda function, and you can see like the only function that are there are the functions that exist within this region. So I could say, yep, enable that trigger. I always like to set up my triggers from Lambda, but that's more because I'm a coder, I think, than anything else. So my perspective is always from a software developer perspective as opposed to like a DBA or... So I always like to handle this from Lambda. So I'm going to go ahead and add the trigger. So Dynamo, Baseball Stats. Okay, and we're going to enable the trigger. Okay, so this is the same error. If I look closely at the error, basically what's happening is, is this Lambda function does not have access to DynamoDB. Okay, so we said that would be a problem. Right now, the role only has access to run this code. So I can go back over to the IAM console for the role that was created, and I can attach a policy. So I want a DynamoDB policy. So I could say for that table, you have access to invoke a Lambda function, um, but since we're adding it from the Lambda function back to DynamoDB, I'm just going to say, yep, you have access to DynamoDB. I probably should be more restrictive about the specific object, but I'm just going to attach the policy. And now if I go back to Lambda, I should be able to add this trigger. Okay, so we tried it once, it failed, but now that our role has access to DynamoDB, we should be able to add the trigger. So now any change that goes into that database is going to trigger this function. So I come over to the database and I'm looking at the items. Okay, so I'm gonna insert the brewers as a new record and it's gonna trigger my Lambda function. Okay, so I'm going to create an item. My team ID will be uh, 
team info underscore MLW for Milwaukee. And then my sort key will be MLW. And then the team name, is that what we're looking for? Yep, team name will be the Milwaukee Brewers. Okay, so I'm gonna create this item. So when I created that, that should have caused that Lambda function to execute. Okay, so then I go back over to Lambda. And now what? All right, that, that was kind of my experience when I first started dealing with triggers. It's like, okay, did it run? I don't know, no idea. So if I go into monitoring, this is where frustration is going to set in for you, and I'll encourage you not to get frustrated. So I go into monitoring, and you can see that that function got invoked one time, just now. If I scroll down, the only way I can really see what's going on is with these CloudWatch logs. So the CloudWatch logs are going to be critically important to you, and it takes a minute or two before the recent invocations show up in these CloudWatch logs. So eventually, if I delay long enough and talk long enough, you'd end up seeing a CloudWatch log saying, hey, this function was triggered. Here's the start. Here's the end. Life's moving along. The function was triggered. Okay. While I'm kind of, you know, just killing time, waiting so that we can look at these recent invocations, we're going to run into a problem because our function's not really doing anything, right? So if I'm looking at this, it's not really doing anything, okay? So uh, nothing's really happening here. So here's my code. I'm creating a constant that has nothing to do with the fact that I inserted a new record and I returned that response. So it has nothing to do with the fact that something happened in Dynamo and now I'm taking an action based on that. Like the code's kind of generic, right? So I want to create some code that is actually relevant to Dynamo. I want to see what's available to me. So like I was telling you, um, with our stream that we set up in DynamoDB, I get essentially a change log. Like what happened? I added a new record, right? So I, I want that change log. Okay, so what I want to do is I want that data. That data is going to be important to me. So what I want to do is eventually I'm going to change that Milwaukee Brewers record to have some other um, abbreviation. So I used MLW, and maybe I don't want that for my Milwaukee uh, abbreviation. So I want to see that change happen. This event object is going to get passed to me from DynamoDB as a result of the trigger. The event object is what actually holds our data. Okay, so uh, I want to look at that data and see what's available to me so that I know what actions are available to me. Right, what are you sending me? You're sending me the change log, of it, essentially. That change log is going to be embedded in that event object. So I need to be able to see it. So if I just try to, um, I'm just going to get rid of the code that's there. If I take this event object and I just return it, I'm still not going to see it because I don't have access to the calling function. All right, I'm not the one calling this. It's not coming from a test event. It's coming as a result of that trigger. So I could let the trigger know, like, here's the event, but the trigger is what sent me the event. So I don't want to return it necessarily. I'm eventually going to want to pull the data out. But for the time being, all I want to do is see what's available to me. So in order to see what's available to me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to console.log this. And when I use that console.log, usually it's going to show up in my developer tools within my browser. Does everybody know what I'm talking about there? So if I right click a tab and I say inspect and I go to the developer tools, normally we're talking about this console or whatever environment we're running in. If we're in Node, we might be within a terminal. In our case, 
when I log this, it's going to log it to those CloudWatch logs. So I want to log this event. I'm just going to stringify it. So saying, take that event, stringify it, and log it. So convert that JSON object, which is the event object, to a string and then log it to my CloudWatch logs. And then I have to save this. Okay, and uh, my guess is now if I go back to monitoring, I should have that CloudWatch log. I'm not positive that I will. So now you can see that it's there. And this doesn't have a ton of information for me yet because I didn't have any real code. So I can see when it started, when it ended. If I expand all these, you can see how there's nothing there. It just kind of tells me what I was built for. Not real useful information, but the function did get triggered is kind of what we're proving there. Okay, so now I want to trigger the function again. I want to go in and I want to modify the Milwaukee Brewers. So I'm going to edit this. So instead of MLW, um, let's change it to the Madison Brewers. I'm not going to change the key. So I'm going to save it. So now from the Milwaukee Brewers, we have the Madison Brewers. We made that modification. So our old is Milwaukee, our new is Madison. If I go back to my function, I'm still monitoring. I'm going to have to refresh this. And again, probably have to kill some time here. I think it shows up faster the second time you invoke it because it has to instantiate your function and then execute it. So if it's coming in cold, essentially it has to load your code and run your code so it's a little bit slower. And then subsequent invocations are faster once it's loaded into memory. But I don't know about these CloudWatch logs. So we're going to be waiting here for a second. And you can try to click around and say, I only want the ones in the last hour. I can customize it to say, I only want the last three minutes worth. I think the invocations get updated rather quick, but the logs don't. And there, there's no real way to speed this up, so it's still only showing one invocation. The other thing with this is that the newest invocations are always going to show up at the top. So this is the old invocation, and I can kind of tell from the timestamp, but the timestamp's not all that readable. That was the first one, and again, we have no data in there other than like this is what happened. Eventually we will have our second triggered event. Believe me, the first time I tried to set this up, I'm like, this isn't running. I can't debug this at all. It's super hard to debug. I don't have answers. And then about a half hour later after I walked away, I come back and I'm like, oh, all those invocations happened. And then my data started showing up and then like it's just more like a an exercise in patience than anything else. But again, if you're not using these CloudWatch logs, you have no idea what's going on with your functions and how they're getting invoked. Like you're not getting a return value, you're not seeing them through a test event, you don't get success failure, and you don't get much information unless you go in to monitoring and look at these CloudWatch logs. Have to be using the CloudWatch logs. Okay, so our second invocation finally showed up. The one that we care about is this latest log, right? It's the, the first one now. If I click on it, it brings it up in CloudWatch. And then I should be able to see some actual data. Okay, so if you remember last time, all we had was like the latest and then the end and then a report about what the billing cost was. But now that I put that console.log in to say log the event, 
I can expand that one. And this is the event that ends up happening. So within the records, I can see that the event was a modify. It happened on US East 2, which is Ohio. It said, you know, here's the record. Here's the keys for the record that was modified. Here's the new version, Madison Brewers. Here's the old version, the Milwaukee Brewers. It's a lot of data. So, again, streams. When I enable streams, this is the data that's available to me within the stream. Okay, it's not necessarily easy to access, so I, I don't want to suggest that it is. Um, but you have access to it for 24 hours. So you have access to that stream data for 24 hours. It's kind of a continuous stream of changes on your database. I have access to it. Um, when I access the stream programmatically, it is not as clean as this. So if I want this information and I want a historical copy of it, this might be the information I'm working with. This is fairly clean. I might want to keep new and old records as an audit trail. Why'd you change that? Who, like if I was a stock broker and I have traders buying and selling stocks, like I probably want a report of who's doing what, right? It's probably important. Have you ever, you've read those articles where the guy will be off by a zero and bought 3 billion instead of 300 million or instead of 30 million by 300 million and causes crashes or whatever. Like I, I want to know who did it. If I screw up that bad, 300 million versus 3 billion, I'm probably just going to hide, right? Yeah, like I'm just going to hide. Like it wasn't me. It was someone else. But if we have audit logs of who changed it, that's going to be important. Okay, so again, streams are nice. So streams keep that data for one day, but maybe I don't find out about it for a month because I tried to hide it, right? Trying to keep my job, I'm going to have subsequent trades to make up for my huge mistake and then it usually gets worse. But I have this data and I can then take the data and have subsequent functionality. To see who viewed it? Uh, not, there's not logs about viewing data. Okay, so it's only about changes. So modifications, inserts, updates, deletes. This is fairly easy to access then. Okay, so if I care about these records, it's an array. So the event object is an object. It's JSON. We talked about JSON and how it's going to show up all over the place. So the event object is an object. The object has a key, which is records, like what is actually changed. I index into it. And within the collection of records, there's one record for the change. And then I can pull out whatever data I want. So if I just want to know like when changes happened, new and old, I can pull all of that data out. Okay. So this is kind of a DynamoDB transaction, essentially. It's a, it's a record keeping of a transaction. I updated it. If I come back over to DynamoDB and I say, well, I'm going to delete the brewers because I just want the data that we had. So I delete it. What that's going to do is it's going to trigger a remove. Like if I'm, if I'm looking at CloudWatch, you can see the event is modify. When I delete something, the event is a remove. So there will eventually be another CloudWatch log in here saying, hey, you know, you removed that record. Again, it's going to take some time before I see that invocation. But eventually there will be that third invocation. Okay. Let's handle the same thing with S3. Okay, so I want to look at the data that S3 shares with me. Okay, so the process is not different. So I'm going to have an S3 bucket, and then I can choose um, what triggers my Lambda function, whether it's a new file showing up, or a modification, or a delete. 
So I get to choose which S3 event triggers my Lambda function. But when it does trigger my Lambda function, I'm going to get different data in that event object. Right? Because it doesn't make sense. Like having a new image and an old image for a record, like that's that's not the same thing for me in S3. In S3, we're managing files. We're managing resources on the file system essentially. It's like a it's like a distributed file system is kind of how I like to think of S3. Okay, so if I head out to S3. And I'm going to create a bucket just for this demo. So this is going to be my S3 trigger demo bucket. And it doesn't want me to have uppercase. I'm just taking all of the defaults. Okay, and then I'm going to go back to Lambda. And in Lambda, I'll create a new function for the S3 trigger. Again, we do not want this dummy code that's here. And I want to start right away by logging because I know I'm going to have to wait anyway. So I want to log this event object right away. So it's going to be the exact same code. I'm just going to log um, the JSON stringified version of the event. And that'll put it in my CloudWatch log. Okay, so my function's fine. And now I need to set up my trigger. So in the designer, I'm going to add a new trigger. My trigger this time is going to be from S3. It says which bucket. And then I have an option of what's going to actually trigger this. All object create events. So if I put post copy all object delete events, my choice. So do I want notification of everything? I can set up multiple triggers. I'm going to do all object create events in this case. I can set up prefixes to say, you know, I only want to get notified when a specific folder within my S3 bucket gets modified. If you add a new image. And I'll give you an example of that. What if I have a web-based system and I store all your images in S3? So all of us are going to upload a profile pic, right? So if we're talking about social media, I put a picture of myself up there and I call it profile.png. I probably don't want to call the image profile.png, right? That'd probably be bad because everyone's going to have a profile PNG file. So I probably want to create a folder for you for your images if it's a social media app, right? Probably going to be a lot of pictures there. So your profile pic is going to be different than someone else's profile pic. So maybe I create folders based on your username within my S3 bucket for my application. Okay, so my, I might want to get notified when there's a new picture uploaded. And the reason I might want to do that is I might want to create a DynamoDB reference to say you are the owner of that. I don't just assume that because they're in your directory, in your folder, they're your images. Maybe I combine that with, like, here's a list of all the images that you have available to create a photo album or something. Or maybe there's additional data that I care about. You upload the picture, but then you want to tag the picture to say, oh, this is from Halloween in 2018. And these are the people involved. Right, so I want metadata about that picture that you would specify. Then I can't store that with the picture itself. I'd store that somewhere else. I'd, I'd attach it in DynamoDB. Okay, so prefix, we saw that already with permissions. And suffix is more like your file extension. But I'm just going to enable the trigger for anything. Okay, 
Okay, so I'm gonna go out to S3. I'm gonna go to, um, I'm just gonna upload a new picture. So I upload my Brewers logo that I thought I had grabbed from Blackboard, I guess not. That was interesting. I don't know how my browser window got resized with me just clicking. I wanted to cancel out of that to, so I could download the image. So here's my Brewers logo. I'm going to save this link on my desktop. as Brewers logo. And now that it's on my file system, I'm going to upload it. It doesn't need to be public. So now that image got created, should have triggered my Lambda function, and I know that there's some delay there. But now that we are here, I can go back and look at my DynamoDB trigger. So remember we deleted the Brewer's record? I can go back to monitoring it. I should see the three invocations. So my delete is this one. That was the latest one. I added it, then modified it, and then deleted it. So you'll notice that I'm getting this whole list from my DynamoDB trigger. This is the one that I care about. I can tell because I've logged the information. You can see how the modify happened, and then later the remove happened. So if I look at the remove, I can see what happened. Tells me what key from Dynamo. I deleted the Madison Brewers right after I had modified it. So that's my DynamoDB trigger that we were kind of waiting on to see the log. And then I can go back over to my other function in Lambda. My experience has been S3 um, logs show up faster. Obviously not that fast, so I'm guessing we're still going to have to wait a little bit. I can tell that it did get triggered, though. You can see that there is a dot on my graph saying, hey, that got triggered. So you can see that there was one invocation. If I look... I have success and error. So errors will show up in red, success will show up in green. So if I try something and I get errors, obviously it'll show up here in this dashboard. But again, I find the invocation counts and metrics not all that useful when I'm trying to debug as a developer. The logs are where I'm going to have to look. Okay, so eventually this log will show up. I always feel like these uh, demos are kind of anticlimactic in real time, especially when you, you're going to upload the video to YouTube and you're like, oh, I'm just going to sit here for three minutes while the log shows up. At least you can fast forward in YouTube. In class, it's more of a... Yeah, I everyone, I speed up on YouTube, right? Like, I feel like that's the best feature on there is like you can just... And then you can slow it back down and pause it when you need to and yeah. All right, while this is happening, so while we're waiting on the S3 event object to show up, um, the way I want to end today is I actually want to access some of the data. So just so you see how we're going to pull data out of that JSON object, out of that event object. So we know that we have some log data for our DynamoDB trigger. So as I stringify the event, what's really happening is the event is an object. And we can see that event object in our logs. 
So if I grab either of the latest logs, I have the whole stream. And there's two instances where we're actually logging the event. Okay, so what the event is, is it's actually this thing right here. And I'm just going to bring it over to Adam into a new file. So this is my event object. And what I want to do is I just want to um, pull out the event ID. Okay, so I want to pull out that piece of data. Or if we want to be more specific about it, let's pull out the new image. So the event ID and the new image are the two things that I want to pull out of this record. Okay. Keep in mind that there's not going to be a new image for every record and every trigger. Right? So if I'm deleting a record, there's not necessarily going to be a new image. So I probably want to check if the event name is equal to modify before I try to log the fact that I'm looking for a new image. I think there's also a new image if I'm creating a record. I'm not positive on that, but I think that's what it is. So as long as there's a new image, I'll grab the new image. Okay, and I brought it over to Adam because I'm not going to remember the key value pairs that I need to, to access those elements. So I'm skipping back over to uh, my Lambda function. I'm going to go back over to the configuration. And then in the designer, I know that my event object looks like this thing. I think that might make it harder to look at, but since we're just pulling out these top level items, I don't think it will. Okay, so I want to create my object. It's just going to be an empty object. And what I want are I want key value pairs, so I want the event ID. So my object is going to have an event ID. And the way I'm going to get the event ID is from the event object. That's this thing. Then I have to go into the records. And the records returns an array. So I know that the records are always just going to be one individual record for any individual transaction. So unless I'm doing like a batch put item. So if you remember when we loaded our database, there was a CLI call batch put items where I'm putting in multiple items and see multiple records. But if I'm looking at the graphical interface in DynamoDB, I'm not going to batch put items. I'm just going to deal with one record. So I know that I'm dealing with the first record. And then that is going to be this object right here. So event.records at index 0 is this object. So I should be able to pull out the event ID. Okay, and then my object also should have um, the, I don't know what we called it, the new image. I can name it whatever I want, new record. So I'm going to go into the event.records at index 0 again. And then I have to go into DynamoDB and look at the new image. Yeah. Yeah, DynamoDB, and I'm going to look at the new image. And it's case sensitive, so I think this is the right case. New image. That's what we're looking at. So I don't care about all the other garbage that came with the event. I'm just going to stringify my object. Okay, so my object now just has an event ID and what that new image is, and I'm calling it new record. I'm going to go ahead and save this. And then I'm going to go back over to DynamoDB to trigger this when I insert a new item or let me let me just update a record so I'm going to um, modify this to the California Angels
Okay, so I modified a record. That's going to trigger my function. I should be able to see that in my CloudWatch management. Okay, again, so we're in that time delay, right? Of I'm not going to see my CloudWatch logs, but now I should see my CloudWatch logs for my S3 event. So we're going to skip back over to that S3 function. We're going to look at monitoring, and now our recent invocation should show up. Now I can see the event object that got sent to me from my S3 event. Who is the account? Which bucket? What's the key? How big is the file? Those are things that I care about. Where did the file come from? Right? This is the stuff that's important to me when I have an S3 event occur. Maybe I want to get notified of all the object created events, but then I decide to ignore some of them. I can do that in my code. So the trigger happens. It's not a put. I can ignore it. That's fine. Okay. These logs are super helpful. It's the most important thing when you're setting up triggers, because otherwise you have no idea how to debug your code, right? So you might be able to write JavaScript or Python or .NET Core or Java, whatever your code, like you might be completely fluent, but if you can't debug your code and make changes to it, and you don't know what the incoming parameters are, good luck. So use these event logs. Okay, so you can obviously see that the event is, is really critical to those triggers. The event is going to give you the event information. What happened? So I know the event got triggered, but what happened? And the event object is going to tell us what happened. Okay, and then, now that we're there, I should be able to head back to my DynamoDB trigger and I'm looking at monitoring, and hopefully we have our latest, so I can look at this log stream. And the idea with this log stream is we are pulling out individual pieces of information. So you'll see how I don't have the whole event object anymore. I'm just pulling out the event ID and the new record, because that's what's important to me. So I'm filtering down, like, you, the event gave me 50 things. I didn't need all 50 things. I just needed those two pieces of data for what I'm trying to do. I wanted to get notified so that I got those two critical pieces, and I'm pulling those two critical pieces out, and now I'm taking subsequent action based on the data that you sent me. Okay, and that's the, that log information that we're seeing right there. So I created some new object. The new object has two keys, event ID and new record, and then the new record was just a copy from the event object. So this is more in place just so you can see how I can pick out those individual pieces of data that we care about. Okay, JSON makes it fairly easy. So obviously when those events are triggered, the event object contains way more information than most of us will ever use. Like there's critical pieces in there that we care about, but for the most part, it's, it's overdone, and I'm going to pick out individual pieces and do what I want with it. Okay, so now, applying this to your lab. You have the source code you're going to upload into Lambda. And all you're going to do is create an S3 bucket, upload the image. And the idea with the code is, is it's going to create a thumbnail version of that image. So that Python code is already set up. It says, given an image, I'm going to resize it to a 128 by 128 square image. 
Okay, so if you don't want the aspect ratio screwed up, start with a square image because you're scaling it down to a square image. Okay, that's the Brewer's logo comes out pretty, pretty well. Okay, so that's that's the lab. Um, again, you're creating the lambda function. You're creating the S3 bucket. You upload the image. It should trigger your lambda function, and then you should see that resized image. Feel free to play around with the Python code. So I think it like it appends a suffix of underscore resize to the image. I played around with it a couple times and like what I at one point had it, the resized image go into a thumbnails folder as opposed to just storing it in the same folder. I can't remember if that's what happens here. I, I can't remember where I ended up with the function, but you have the function, it'll run. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here for today. Um, On Thursday, we're going to start talking about API Gateway. And there's a lot of background information with API Gateway that we're going to run into in class, which is fine. Um, we're just going to start dealing with how do I create these API endpoints from my Lambda functions. Okay? So, by all means, if, if we start talking about API Gateway and you're lost, like, ask questions. It's, it's a tough concept, and you don't necessarily see it in the other classes here within our curriculum. Okay, so I'm going to stop here for today and then